Yeah. Um, so, uh, first of all, my name is Nicholas Lachlan. I'm a member of the team that runs Bocas Lit Fest. If you've been here yesterday, you've been seeing me jumping up on stage like a monkey at the start and end of every session, so I'm probably a familiar face by now. But I'm doing double duty this morning because um, I, I'm also very proud to be one of the editors of So Many Islands, which is the book that we're going to hear some readings from this morning. Let me tell you a little bit about the book in case you don't know. Um, so, So Many Islands, the subtitle is Stories from the Caribbean, Mediterranean, Indian, and Pacific Oceans. And I think that it's the first time there's ever been an international anthology of new writing that covers uh, writing from, from small island countries around the world, literally from every part of the globe. It started off as a project of Commonwealth Writers, which is the cultural arm of the Commonwealth Foundation in London. Um, and Commonwealth Writers, as some of you may know, um, they've been partners with us here at the festival for many years. They have uh, one of their special areas of focus is Commonwealth countries where perhaps uh, literary infrastructure is not as well developed as in some other places. Um, so the Caribbean is a special area of focus for them. The Pacific is a special area of focus. And this anthology, the idea behind it was to, uh, to first of all, to, to link writers and readers from all these parts of the world so there's 17 different countries represented here, one writer from each country. Um, and they include, you know, in the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago and Grenada represented here on stage, but also Barbados, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Antigua, Jamaica, I'm forgetting somewhere, um, uh, also Bermuda, uh, two countries in the Mediterranean, Malta and Cyprus. In the Indian Ocean, we have uh, Singapore and Mauritius, and in the Pacific, there are lots of small island countries in the Pacific, and I can't even remember all of their names. Never mind that I've edited all these pieces. So places like Samoa, like Fiji, like Kiribati, like uh, Vanuatu, like <laughs> Tracy has actually been to that part of the world. So maybe she, maybe she knows the names better than I do. So the first uh, agenda of the book was to link writers and readers from all these places, as I said. Um, but it was also an attempt to, to give writers from, from some of these very small islands, which have their own thriving cultures and literatures, but we don't know anything about them because they're so small and they're so far away. It was an attempt to, to give a, an international platform for those writers and also just to see what we have in common so that it turns out, not surprisingly, that you know, small islands in the Caribbean have a lot in common with small islands in the Pacific, not least things like um, you know, coconuts and sugarcane, which actually come from that part of the world. We think they're ours, they're Caribbean things, but they both started in that part of the world. Um, but also, we, we have in common a language, because as Commonwealth countries, as former parts of the British Empire, English is the, the kind of, maybe not literally the lingua franca, because franca suggests French, but it's a common language that, that we have in common, so we can read and talk to each other. But we also face a lot of the same issues, political issues, social issues, economic um, issues of you know, kind of development, human rights that are common to us across the world. Anyway, so I was very thrilling for me to be invited to edit this anthology with help from Nyla Falami Imoja, a Barbadian writer. Uh, we never sat in the same room to work on this. Of course, it all happened by email and Skype, which is how we do things nowadays. Um, and we got, uh, so the Commonwealth, Commonwealth writers put out a call for submissions and we got something like 500 pieces being submitted from around the world, which we had to whittle down to. The original brief was 15, we snuck in two extra ones, there's 17 because there was too much good stuff. And we had to make the very difficult decision that we would only have one writer from any one place. So as a Trinidadian, I was very thrilled to see we got enough submissions, great submissions from writers here that we could have done an entire anthology just of the Trinidadian pieces. We weren't allowed to do that. So Tracy, Tracy is the one who got chosen um, for very specific reasons. So um, we launched the book here in, in, um, in Port of Spain back in January. I'm very happy to say that with the help of friends across the Caribbean, we've had launches since then in Barbados, in St. Lucia, and Jamaica, none of which I was present for, but I've seen the photos. Um, <laughs> It's been launched in the Pacific, and in fact, Tracy last December paid a visit to Samoa and to Fiji um, for the sort of Pacific debut of the book. And it was launched just a week and a half ago in London at the, uh, at the uh, Commonwealth, as part of the events around the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting and the Commonwealth People's Forum. So the book has been all over the place. It's been further than me. Um, and um, the other thing I want to say, that uh, the other reason I'm very proud of the book, is that um, it's an international book with three editions. So there's a, there's a Pacific edition published out of New Zealand. 
which I think Tracy's brought, you can see that that's what it looks like. That's the Pacific one. I think our cover is nice. So. There, <laughs> there's a U UK and the rest of the world edition published out of London, but the Caribbean and America's edition, uh, you know, basically the Western Hemisphere edition, is this one, which is published by PCASH Press. And as some of you may know, uh, Bocas recently took on responsibility for the PCASH imprint, which started off as a partnership between People Tree Press and Akashic Books. Um, so we've kind of, we've brought it home. PCASH is now based here in Port of Spain. It's based at the Bocas office. This is the first Bocas PCASH book. The second Bocas PCASH book is being launched tonight. So we've actually got two. So, you know, as, as the book's editor, as a representative of Bocas, as a representative of PCASH, um, I'm very proud that, you know, this book is in the world and that you're all here this morning to hear from two of the writers who are in the book. So that's enough intro from me. Um, so what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll hear uh, some excerpts from Tracy's piece and Jacob's piece, and then we have a bit of a conversation about some of the, the questions that, you know, that come out of the book, and there'll be a chance for you to ask questions as well. So uh, quick introductions, Tracy Assing. Trinidad and Tobago, writer, filmmaker, journalist, activist, a member of our indigenous Carib community. Um, who, she's made a, a film, The Amerindians, that, that, that uh, explores her indigenous heritage. Her piece in the book is an essay called Unaccounted For, which also explores that, that, uh, both that individual and family and community heritage. A beautiful, very lyrical essay, but it's also very hard hitting. Um, next to her, Jacob Ross, um, from Grenada, currently based in the UK. Maybe he'll move back one of these days. Fiction writer, uh, author of many books. Um, his latest book is, is called Tell No One About This. He'll be reading from that this afternoon at another, another event here in the fire station. Um, he's also an associate fiction editor at People Tree Press, and so a man who is very up to date with everything happening in Caribbean fiction. We're delighted to have Jacob back at the festival again this year. It's his second time. So Tracy will, re will read first, then Jacob, and then we'll have a bit of a conversation. So give them a round of applause to welcome them. <clears throat> we'll start. In case you're wondering how we got here, I can affirm that greed played a major role. There is a story told in Trinidad about the origin of the Pitch Lake in La Brea, one of the largest natural deposits of asphalt in the world. The hummingbird was revered as the spirit of the ancestors, but the people became greedy and proud and soon began to hunt the hummingbird for its colorful feathers. Once there was a slaughter, so hungry were the people for adornment for a coming parade. They spent all their energies in preparation for the festival and lost track of every other thing. This could not last. The gods became angry and sought to avenge the spirits of the ancestors by setting a spell in train, which saw the village being swallowed by a huge black mass, which then solidified into the pitch lake. According to the scientific description of asphalt, it is formed when the remains of ancient microscopic algae and other once living things, but the inhabitants of Irie are hard of hearing. The black, sticky, semi-solid liquid was used by Sir Walter Riley around 1595 to cork his ships as he sailed around the Caribbean in search of El Dorado. When he landed in Trinidad, it was the island's indigenous inhabitants who showed him the lake. 300 years later, asphalt from the Pitch Lake was used to pave streets in New York and Washington, D.C., and other cities in the United States. Indigenous land rights and the direct relationship between those rights and mineral extraction have long been debated in North and South America. Unfortunately, these issues have never had a place in national discussions in Trinidad and Tobago. Traditionally, indigenous people do not believe in land ownership. The monetization of land and natural resources came with colonialism. The indigenous have always believed that a close relationship to the land is crucial for survival. Respect for the land is key to indigenous ideology. 
Our indigenous history and story of survival have not been documented consistently or comprehensively. For decades, school textbooks in Trinidad and Tobago referred to warlike Caribs and farming Arawaks, when in fact more than a dozen tribes were documented on these islands with names like Taino, Yeyo, Nepuyo, and Karina. There is archaeological evidence to suggest that these tribes traveled and traded with the South American mainland and up the Caribbean island chain. When the Spanish arrived in the 15th century, control was achieved with the sword and the cross. The indigenous did have a choice, Christianity or death. Those who resisted lived in the forest and those who were converted were given work, clothing and religion. Even after the Spanish conquest, after it was recorded that the indigenous were wiped out, the registers at Roman Catholic churches in Arima, Toco, Paria, Sangre Grande, Aruca, San Fernando, and Princess Town bore out that there were Indios among the faithful. These Indios were indigenous descendants who had been stripped of their identities for fear that any sense of their indigeneity might lead them to think they had a right to some title of ownership for the land on which they were born and raised. So even as the Catholic missions were engaged in the systematic erasure of indigenous culture, their records provide evidence of our survival story. The mission of Santa Rosa de Arima was established in the foothills of Trinidad's Northern Range in 1789. There has never been a box to check in the national census for Indio, Carib, Arawak, Amerindian, or any such signature, but today the indigenous community enjoys some level of recognition nationally through the annual Santa Rosa Carib Festival and the National Day of Recognition, celebrated in August and October, respectively. Indigenous people have been agitating for land rights, but only recently has there been some response from the government, with the Santa Rosa community being granted permission to begin work on a model village, conceived by the Carib chief and president of the Santa Rosa Carib community, Ricardo Barras. Add to that bounty a one-time national holiday in 2017, now we are part of the tourism product. We are included and simultaneously contained. I am the daughter of Ricky, Assing, and Marlene Ballantyne, the sister of Che. I am the granddaughter of John Assing and Mary Werner, born Medina, also Thaddeus Ballantyne and Veronica, born Amoroso. John Assing was the son of Thompson Assing and Clemencia, born Hill, and Mary was the daughter of Ambrosia Medina and Marie Lopez. This is what I remember off the top of my head. This is the way I was taught to introduce myself. It was a way of saying I never walked alone. My grandparents all had brothers and sisters and not everyone settled in Arima. Some stayed in Cora, Paria, Brasso Seco, and Tamina, while others lived in Lopino, Lalaha, Mon La Croix, Mamoral, Blanchichez, and Sangri Grande. We grew up with a strong sense of family, of strength and safety in the family bond. I grew up in Arima. We lived on the bank of the Arima River in an area that was part of the old Tarissala estate. My father had grown up nearby. By fate, my mother's family came to live at the top of the hill of, off Mount Pleasant Road, and soon she was passing by my father's house every day on her way to school. My father attended the all-Catholic Holy Cross College on Calvary Hill, and my mother the all-Catholic school run by nuns down by the river in Torissola. My mother had me in 1975 when she was 16, and both she and my father were still attending secondary school. My father was the second of three brothers. My mother was the first of six sisters, and she had one brother. We lived with my paternal grandparents at the bottom of the hill, on the river bank. My dad's eldest brother also lived on the property in a small wooden house he had built himself. He lived there with his wife and four children, my cousins, Helen, Marsha, Kirk, and Brent. My father was rebellious at school, but had very good grades. He kept his hair long despite the rules and argued with his teachers. He excelled in his art classes and started reading about different ideologies and political systems. He was barely into his teens 
when he started hanging out at labor meetings and discussing Marxist socialist ideology with a few of the men who would go on to form the National Union of Freedom Fighters, NUF, in the 1970s. His knowledge of the trails through the Northern Range became indispensable to the guerrillas. The trails he used as a child to explore the forest could be used as escape routes. The forest fruit trees and wild yam vines and his ability to spot animal tracks ensured a food supply. The rivers and waterfalls were their water source and another way of moving through the forest. My mother was also a good student but wasn't allowed to complete her education at the convent run school. When I was a child, the daytime was full of activities, and at twilight, our teachers were our tantan, tanti, gang, parents, brothers, and sisters. If we were lucky, we would get a story with drama and singing, and each story had its rationale and lesson. Auntie Irene, sister of Mary, sang best and would compose songs about how beautiful her sisters were. We didn't have a television set until I was eight but we were never bored as there was so much to do outside. We spent almost every waking hour outdoors and a lot of those hours were on the river. We always felt close to our ancestors, first by remembering and speaking the names of the birds, the animals, the trees, the herbs, all species of river fish, the snakes, the roots, the fruits, the grass and the insects, the names of the places and the names of the rivers. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, nice to be here. Nice to see those lovely faces across there, shining and oh yeah, kind of thing. Um, I, I was... Uh, a child of the Grenada Revolution. And in 1983, um, there was basically the execution of nine of the people who led the country. One woman, eight men, uh, including the Prime Minister, Maurice Bishop. And it took me over 30 years to even begin to put my mind around the possibility of writing a story that in a way captured the essence, if not of that period, then of the man who uh, I think was extremely important for Eastern Caribbean, probably Caribbean, probably world politics, Maurice Bishop. And this is a story about, it's about a woman called Annie and everybody thinks she's crazy, except herself. And it's happened as a result of, you know, she's there, she grew plants, couldn't have children, quite old. Uh, and one day, Mr. Thorne uh, is passing, going somewhere else to a cooperative, and he sees this, this woman uh, tending roses, and he, he says what politicians would say, nice roses, lovely, really good, you know, grow one for me. And she took him literally, and she decided to grow one for him. <laughs> uh, or grow a bunch of roses, or grow roses for him. And it's a long story. I just read an extract. And we're here at a point where changes are happening internally. And she's, it took her a year to grow these roses. And she decides to bring these roses for Mr. Thorne. You know, he thought it was as simple as that, not thinking of security. She, she, you know, is, and she called him, you know, she called him bird men. Uh, and so on. So this is where Annie is more or less about to, <clears throat> to do that. And I'll read probably to the end because there isn't much. I, I did edit it down. She might have forgotten all about that promise if eight weeks later there hadn't been the bomb that almost killed him. Something new had settled on the island. She sensed it straight away like the arrival of bad weather a darkening that a person could not put a name to but felt all the same. She saw it in the gun that Slim, the young militia man, began wearing on his hip, in the children sneaking off at night with him in those green jeeps and returning in the small hours of the morning. Their faces were grim and they talked only of blood and heavy manners. 
what would she say to Mr. Thorne? She wasn't going to prepare no words because the truth need no rehearsing. She might tell him, if he had the time, about the year it had taken to bring this cutting to what it was now, of how in growing this gift for him, there was also cruelty, the destruction of the stunted and malformed, the burning and uprooting. She might make him aware that she paid for her cruelty with blood because this rose bush wore a fortress of thorns that did not spare her hands. But it was worth the trouble, not so. Was enough to know that its flowers would fill his office with a lovely scent to be replaced with new flowers even as the cut ones died. The morning of the rally, she dressed in her white canvas shoes, the blue cotton dress and soft straw hat that she took out only for funerals in church. She prepared two small parcels, one with a rooted cutting, the other was with freshly cut flowers, both of which she nestled in a larger bag. And then she leaves and she, gets, she, she goes to this massive rally. She stepped out into a sizzling sun, a dizzying swirl of flags and the heavy press of bodies. So much blasted people. She eased herself into the press. Bodies carried her forward from time to time. A meaty shoulder floundered into her and she tightened her grip on the bag. It was evening and she'd almost reached the stage. She'd already heard the short man with the head of Picky Picky here talk about better roads and drainage. The thin young fellow with the pointy beard explaining why the island needed newer, bigger guns. And for the first time, Annie was touched by doubt. The paper bag felt much heavier than it had this morning. Chupid me to think that offering it to Mr. Thorne, him taking it and thanking her, was going to be worth all them early morning trips down to the river, just to load a wicker basket full of loam and rotting leaves. A young man with a wide stance and clean-shaven head was all that stood between her and the stage. The man in the soldier's cap was almost finished speaking and the hum of the crowd was shuddering the air. Yet she felt a quiet underneath that noise, a new electricity. And now there he was, Mr. Thorne, rising to his feet lifted by the roar of the thousand that he'd called before him. For a moment, she was distracted by the face of the woman who sat and smoked beside him. She turned up her face to him and was smiling for the first time. Mr. Thorne raised an arm and drew a sky roar that went on and on and got bounced back by the encircling hills. Then silence because he was nodding at a sway of braceleted arms on the grass below. A pair of arms untangled themselves from the others. A woman called his name, and then her body began to rise, lifted on the tide of bodies under her. She teetered on the lip of the platform, held there by a forest of hands. Then she righted herself and was on the stage. Heavily pregnant, the woman opened her arms to Mr. Thorne. Already five bird men had gathered around her, their hands busy on her body. The tallest embraced her from behind, grinning and whispering in her ear as if she were the bearer of his child. He traced the rungs of her stomach with his hands, stopped only when decency would not allow his fingers to go further. Then he patted her shoulders, spread his fingers wide, and all the other birdmen stepped away. The woman delivered herself to Mr. Thorne. He embraced her as if all his life he had been waiting for this woman so that he could press his beard into her hair and rock her with the slow care of a lover. And then he released her to the birdmen who guided her off the stage. Now Mr. Thorne was speaking. He was saying the same things that those who had come before him said, and yet it sounded different. He was gathering in all their words and putting his life breath into them. Like the children in this park, Annie too felt the lift of being carried on a voice that needed no choir to support it and no big black book to give it weight. She saw how all this giving of himself had aged him, even from that last time when he'd come to her village 
the lines had deepened on his forehead. The beard was now salted with white. Maybe it was from remembering the bomb that had killed the girls. Maybe it was because it made him turn to killing too. She must have been lost for a while, her attention drifting because Mr. Thorne was lifting his hand in that concluding way of his before the stroke of thunder that always came from him, forward ever, backward never. She didn't know what she said or if she said anything, but the young man in front of her turned round, blinking as if she'd pulled him out of a dream. He dropped his eyes to the back she'd opened up to show him. He stepped aside and let her through. She'd almost gone past the bird men when a hand closed around her elbow and the world around her dimmed. A body bounced her backward. She felt herself falling, but hands closed around her armpits and kept her on her feet. On the stage, birdmen had made a circle around Mr. Thorne, their backs to him. A big fist closed around her hand, the hand that held the bag. Fiery threads of pain ran up her arm and pulled around her shoulder as the thorns of the rose sank into her. They were hustling her backwards when a voice cut through. She recognized it as the woman's, the one who sat by Mr. Thorne. A birdman pushed out an arm in front of her. The woman raised her chin at him and they locked eyes. He stepped aside and let her through. She found herself walled in by the birdman's heavy flesh with the woman in front of her. Those bright, dark eyes were on her face. Close up, she looked much younger. Annie followed the woman's downward gaze saw the fine trails of her own blood on the paper bag. It's the rose, she said. The rose for Mr. Tom. He asked for it. The woman was gentle when she took the bag, opened it, and peered inside. Her eyes were softer when she raised her head. Thank you, comrade sister, the woman said. She stripped away the leaves, dug a thumbnail into the base of each thorn, and plucked it off. She curled steady fingers around the stem of each flower and broke it short. Thank you, she said again. The bird men followed the woman to the other side of the stage. The crowds were spilling out onto the road, their voices raised in song. The last of the sunlight haloed their shapes against the darkness of the old iron bridge. The woman joined Mr. Thorne, the five roses pressed against her breasts. He placed a hand in the small of her back and she held up the flowers to his face. He said something to her and smiled. She jerked a thumb over her shoulder. Mr. Thorne took the flowers and brought his face down to the small bunch. At the open door of the long black car, he handed them to her. The bright-eyed woman took the gift with cupped hands, her face turned up to his. Then they lowered their heads and shoulders and disappeared into the vehicle. Thank you. So that's just uh, a taste of what's in, of what's in so many islands. Um, I want to start by asking a question to both of you. Um, well, first of all, I say, let me say something else. We, there was originally supposed to be a third writer here this morning, um, a third contributor to the anthology, um, Mary Tato, who is from Rotuma, which is an island that's part of Fiji. Um, Fiji, like Trinidad and Tobago, and like the Bahamas, so other you know, countries in the Caribbean is it's more than one island, it's not just Fiji. Uh, Mary was supposed to be here, uh, but unfortunately, visa issues made it impossible for her to travel because you can't travel from Fiji to Trinidad without passing through somewhere bigger. <laughs> and it turned out it was not possible to get her visa in time. So that's disappointing. But it made me think about the fact that, um, you know, our relationships, the islanders around the world, places like Fiji and Trinidad, our relationships, even sometimes just our physical relationships, are still mediated by, by bigger and more powerful countries. Um, so, you know, in terms of travel, in terms of politics, in terms of culture. So my question to both of you, to Tracy and Jacob, is um, given that fact, what, if anything, 
did you know about the writing that comes from places like the Pacific, like the Indian Ocean, from countries like, like Fiji, like Kiribati, like Tonga, like Samoa? What did you know about the writing from those places before, before so many islands, if anything? Tracy? Uh, well, I, I actually didn't have um, any experience with any of the writing from the Pacific beforehand, but um, as an indigenous person, it was always an area of the world I looked to um, just to seek more information about because I was aware that um, the Pacific Islands actually contains the largest um, concentrated number of indigenous people in the world. Um, the ring of fire. So I was always kind of um, fascinated with it, even though I, I, I really wasn't exposed to any literature that came out of the area. Yeah, um, well, for me, not much. I, I have read in four competitions, like the Commonwealth Writers' Prize and, you know, um, sort of beyond stories coming from a whole range of cultural spaces, uh, which <laughs> was in fact instructive for me, but not as, I didn't know some of these countries exist, existed, mm. to be honest with you, much to my embarrassment. Uh, but I was very, very interested in the stories in there and the, the, the range of styles and narrative modes and voices um, that reinforced my view about uh, the stories that we, we get. The stories, with him, it's really interesting because we tend to think when we, when we talk about the short story, we tend to think really uh, the, about the dominant, of the dominant, uh, the dominant narrative style that we get from the North, meaning North America, Europe, and England. But uh, as I will explore hopefully later on, uh, every culture has its own way of telling stories. And our writers tend not to, by virtue of the education we have had, we tend to uh, not mimic because we do better than mimic. We literally become very, very fluent in the narrative styles um, of other cultural spaces, however big they might be, do the dominant cultural space by virtue of our education. So I was very interested in what, what was happening in these stories which was specific to these the peoples and the cultures from which these stories come. So the book is valuable from that point of view. I'm not trying to push it, you know. <laughs> it just happens to be, it's, it's pretty no, valuable please, please from that push perspective. It. <laughs> Well, so the, the follow-up to that then is, um, I'm, I'm curious to know, so obviously I've read everything in the book several times, and hopefully both of you have read you know, some or all of the book in the months it's been out. I'm curious to know um, what, 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 what surprised you maybe about some of the stories, the, the poems, the voices, the kinds of ideas in the book. What, what did you not expect to find, and what, what were the unexpected discoveries from you in, in reading the, the contrib contributions, from, especially from the more distant parts of the world? Tracy, maybe. The most uh, interesting. Um, I, the, the thing about it is that um, for, from what I've seen from indigenous writers, there is a, a common thread, actually, about our relationship to the land and about the issues of climate change, the issues that, that face us now, this is a common thread um, in all of the writing and expression I've seen uh, from indigenous writers, uh, or the writers that were um, chosen for the book from the Pacific. Um, there's also, you know, it's, it's refreshing, it was refreshing to see just what the imagination um, kind of brought to the pen from these people who are all living in spaces surrounded by water. It's very diverse, actually, what the mind reaches for. And um, so that was very interesting. Um, the story out of Cyprus from um, Eratu, um, which kind of was about her, her gran basically making up a fantasy about what had happened to her husband during the war and it had something to do with Elizabeth Taylor. You know, it was just, um, it, it, it was kind of fascinating to see just, you know, just the leaps that the imagination would take, you know, coming out of these spaces. That was fascinating to me. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I, I was struck by, I mean, like, um, and it was there in, in your Tracy's uh, 
narrative is to do with th this need to reconnect with a, with a fractured past. Um, that, that was very much there. And something which I expected um, and still would like to see in, 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 in contemporary narrative coming from the islands is the, 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 ever, the presence of the sea. <laughs> We're surrounded by the damn thing. And, and yet it's not as strongly reflected in literature as I would expect. I mean, the, the, the writer who, the Caribbean writers I know who have done a lot with the sea as perhaps one of the richest metaphors you can draw on, people like Walcott, this poetry, um, and the occasional poem you get from, from, from um, you know, writers like A.J. Seymour, I shall always be remembering the sea and so on. But not, uh, uh, and within that, I did expect that, and it's there. Uh, but the sea, almost like a character on the page, is, is something which I'm looking forward to seeing. You know, the kind of, it's, it's what um, Melville did with Moby Dick in a way. The, it, where's the great Caribbean novel? Um, or the great whatever island novel that acknowledges this damn thing which is around us. We fenced in by it, you know? Um, so, yes, in a way, you know, and I didn't do it either in that story, by the way. It was not about the sea, it was about a politician. So, I'm just as guilty. I, um, is that, is that, that anyone in the audience want to ask a question? Are there any questions? We've got one right in here. Okay, so Mike will make its way to you. It's coming from the back of the room. Right in very front row. Because I've got lots to ask them, but maybe you have lots to ask them too. Morning to everybody. Uh, first, Tracy, first question. In your book, which you wrote here about your father connecting with enough gorillas, Special Branch ever visited your home since that publication of that book? Right, that's one. And to the Grenadian guy, um, I think you are talking about the June 19, 1980 bomb blast in the poem, in the yeah. uh, writing? Yeah. Eh? Yes. Car thank you. All right, uh, so uh, my home has not been visited by a special branch, but I'm sure the information came as no surprise to them. So um, in my youth, that would have been something that was more common. Hi, I just wanted to say a big thank you to both of you. They were beautiful, beautiful stories. Tracy, I was just amazed by two things. One your straightforward style of writing, um, not leavened by excessive adornment, and I thought it was really, really effective. Um, the simplicity of it and the boldness. I also wanted to ask you if you've been in touch with other people fighting for the rights of indigenous people in Cuba and also in New York City. We have the Museum of the American Indian. Have you been in touch I, I with have, them? I have been to the museum, um, but I haven't been in touch with perhaps the people you've been speaking, you're speaking about directly. Um, but in traveling with this book and even in traveling with the Amerindians, I was able to meet um, other freedom fighters in Canada, uh, people from South and Central America, people from the Pacific, people from different parts of Africa, indigenous people fighting for recognition in different parts of Africa. And um, I mean, one of the things that actually came out of the Chokam discussions actually um, is an ambition by myself to um, begin work on a podcast, which is actually um, aimed specifically at uh, giving air to the voices of indigenous women from around the world. Indigenous women have things to discuss together and uh, I'm kind of very actively trying to put something like that together. Um, as for my writing style, I think a lot of what I do now is informed by the fact that I have a journalism background. And so I was always, as a journalist, looking for balance and um, trying to express in authentic ways without embellishing, which you know is, is something that's happening a lot more now. But I feel like um, that's probably where a lot of that comes from because it's how I approach a story. I'm, I, I kind of approach 
a story with a question, even with that story, a question about myself. So it's always about trying to, you know, leaning towards accuracy more uh, mm -hmm. than anything else um, and balance. Yeah. Thank you very much. Tracy, I want to ask you something that kind of follows up on that because um, as I said earlier on, um, you uh, went to events for the, for the book in, in two Pacific countries. We've spoken about this, but maybe the audience would like to hear a bit about how audiences there in that part of the world, um, how they reacted to what you wrote and what, what gaps your piece filled in for them. Um, the, the, the piece was very, I was very warmly embraced um, in the Pacific. Um, there were lots of things that they can identify, they could identify with in the story. In fact, even in the, some of the names of things, um, a lot of our ecology is exactly the same. The flora and fauna there is exactly the same and um, there were lots for them to identify with. Also in terms of um, the, the fact that island fortunes are more or less built on natural resource extraction. I mean, you can go into a store here and get Fiji water. In Trinidad, you can get water from Fiji. And maybe you need to ask yourself if that's really necessary. I mean, um, I also saw in Fiji that they were doing um, a lot of um, road paving works from the airport. And it dawned on me as well that that asphalt had traveled halfway around the world. They're not wasting it, by the way. They're not paving and repaving as we do. They are actually taking care to use this thing which they know they paid for and came half way around the world. So there were lessons there as well in terms of how we treat our natural resources and what happens when they go somewhere else. That's stuff that we never really think about. You know, um, our water is also exported, by the way, you know. Um, the, the, the thing is that they really, there's a part of my story, I mean, a lot of my story also has to do with recognition, right? Um, you know, um, indigenous people being recognized here, me being recognized as an indigenous person, um, indigenous people here being recognized by other indigenous people. And, um, and all of that happened in Fiji and Samoa. There was such a tremendous embrace. There was an old, older woman there whose family name actually um, contains Mo Moana, which we all know as, as part of a Disney tale now, but has a, a much richer history in those islands. Um, and she came up to me afterwards and she said that she was so proud and so happy that I was brave enough to write that story. So I was really embraced there. And um, in Samoa, I, I actually was given this tattoo as well. Um, there was a special ceremony and um, this tattoo was, is, is, uh, is part of a tradition of tattoos that are only given to women. And um, it was given to me to uh, give more fire to my voice and also as a form of protection. And um, you know, you can't just walk off the street and get a blessing like that. And so I was uh, really um, moved by the fact that I was so embraced and welcomed and supported and that continues today um, because this this book um, has also kind of led to a network of 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 women writers uh, not to exclude the men but it's actually just happened very naturally and um, so the, the other women that are featured in this book um, who uh, I've had the pleasure to meet. We've all um, grown through meeting each other. Our, our work um, has grown and um, we find strength in what each other has been able to express. Um, so that has also, I'm sure you, you didn't expect that, Nick, but that has also, you know, you've, you've kind of sparked a women's movement with the book as well. I'm glad to hear. As it happens, there, there's 17 writers in the book and only four men, which I think, I mean, I think it's obvious to us here in the Caribbean that the, the, the current generation of emerging writers is predominantly women, which is a change to what, what the case was 50 or 60 years ago. And it seems maybe it's the same in other parts of the world. None of the Pacific writers is a man. So all women writers from the Pacific, both women writers from the Mediterranean. So, and that was, um, 
you know, I think that, you know, ideally, Commonwealth writers would have liked a very balanced book, a balance of countries, regions, geographies, and probably a balance of genders. But the fact was, we chose the pieces that we felt were the strongest pieces and the ones that had the most interesting stories to tell. And they were mostly by women writers. But I want to ask Jacob a question, because Jacob, when you were introducing um, the story, uh, you said something interesting, which is that it took you a very long time to feel that you were able to write about the revolution. Yeah. And in this case, so it's Tracy's piece is an essay. Um, your piece is, is fiction. And I'm curious to know, Tracy talked a bit about what, as an essayist, what, you know, about authenticity, accuracy, getting things right. As a fiction writer, th that, that's different because yeah. it's expected that you're, you're changing the facts but still getting it in, an essential truth. Um, what was it like trying to turn that, that very personal, but also that very public shared experience of the revolution into fiction? And how, if at all, how have um, other Grenadians or other people who, who were there or knew, knew what was going on, how have they reacted to the piece? Yeah, um, it's a very good question and a very important one. Um, there is a massive silence, there's a kind of willful amnesia around the, that episode in Grenadian history where men and women who knew each other quite often slept in the same beds either as you know people running from a certain kind of the threat of execution or whatever it is because the americans were on a case the u.s state department um, were very very concerned about uh the grenada revolution largely because it was the first socialist revolution where the people the agents spoke english and therefore, it, and, and all the prime ministers in the rest of the Caribbean were absolutely terrified, not least Tom Adams and Eugenia Charles. But we can talk about that. You can ask questions about it <laughs> later on. Um, and it, was a massive, it, it was a massive thing. But it was such a trauma. And I was right in the middle of it. I was there when, they, when, when, when the country was invaded. And it, you have not been invaded. If you get invaded, it do, I don't know what rape feels like, but I know what penetration feels like. You know, and that is it, that precisely what, what, what happened. And there are lots of paradoxes within that, that, that kind of space. And I remember going to London, literally fleeing to London. You know, um, I had a choice of places, but I chose London for, well, for the usual reasons. You know, there was a partner there, somebody I wanted to spend my life with. Anyway, leave that aside. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and being there, I remember sitting and writing literally within two months. I had what I thought was a book. Uh, because, but when I reread it, I realized that I can't, this thing wouldn't get, wouldn't get published because it was so hysterical, you know. Now I, re I have returned to Grenada, and I do go there ev um, once every year or two. I spend some time there, and I have been digging, digging. Most of the people who were part of that thing, they're at an age now where they're beginning to feel their own mortality, you know. They know, like, time kind of short. So they, they have begun to talk. Some of the things I've been uncovering, they're absolutely shocking. I wouldn't tell you this because you wouldn't buy my book if you already know. Uh, but I intend to write something around it. Um, some of them feel threatened. Um, some of them feel pretty, pretty insecure. Um, there are a couple of people who were in prison for 20 something years. And um, there was one in particular who literally sent me a veiled threat. And I said to him, this 890, because I was at, I'm asking pretty probing questions. Uh, you discover people who, you know, were behind this thing and they were not necessarily, you know, the obvious ones. You get a sense of, well, manipulation and scheming and, and, and a kind of viciousness too. And a couple of these people, at least one of them was felt so insecure because probably could be put in prison for a murder nobody took into account kind of thing. I, I was certain. And I just say, well, this is, this is not really 1983. You ain't got no power. And I'm going to broadcast that, you, that you're threatening to, 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 to do damage to, to my good person. And only that, to, but I have a whole army outside there can come and take your ass down. <laughs> um, of course, that is Brango and you know, that is the usual. Um, so there is a secrecy. There is a hiding. There is this desire um, not to let people know or not to remember because it had been such a trauma for us. And believe me, my generation has not recovered from that. We have not. Um, I am probably one of the few writers, including um, perhaps uh, in addition to Mel Collins, who has written one book, The Angel Around It, who is prepared to just absolutely go for it. Books have come out. Um, there are a couple of books, have come, one by Bernard Code, one by Ewart Lane, um, one by a guy called Abdullah, right? And every single one of them, in my estimation, 
is a justification of an untenable position. Do you understand? It's trying to explain oneself. And because they, and, 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 and they count on they count on this notion that there is nobody there to answer back because the one who would answer back are dead. But me and dead. I write here. So and somebody has to answer back. So that's really it's a long answer to a short question. But you know, it, it gets me going. Thank you. <laughs> short question but a big one. Yes. So I I know there were there were some more questions in the audience. However, I'm afraid that part of my job here is to keep things running on time, and I'm looking at my watch, and we are actually out of time. So here's the good news. Two bits of good news for you. Number one is that the book is available for sale from the booksellers inside. So you can all, because now that you've heard the two writers, you want to hear the rest of their pieces, I'm sure. So you can buy the book. Second piece of good news is both writers will be out at our book signing table just here on the terrace. You can take your book to them. Uh, they will still talk to you even if you don't buy the book. It's okay. So if you just want to ask them something. I won't. Congratulate them, make a point. <laughs> They'll still be there, so you're going to have a chance to, to, to chat to them. And um, the next event, which is going to start in just a few minutes, um, those of you who have uh, seen the printed program, you know that it was supposed to be a one on one with Lorna Goodison, but I think the word has got round that Lorna was unfortunately not able to travel to be here with us. Uh, so we've got uh, an equally wonderful replacement, um, the British writer Afua Hirsch is going to be here talking about her new book, British. Uh, it's Brit brackets-ish, and it's a book about identity, about ethnicity, about contemporary Britain, and it's a book that has uh, an, an, you know, incredible relevance. It, it was relevant before, but it's especially relevant after everything that's been happening in the UK in the past two weeks. I, I think every person in the Caribbean is following the whole scandal of the Windrush immigrants and anyway, I don't need to tell you anything about that. Afu is going to talk about that. So that's, she's going to be here in just a few minutes. Um, so authors outside, you can talk to them. Books available for sale. Please give them a round of applause to thank them. And we have a packed program the rest of the day. So I hope you've all taken the day off and you're going to be sticking around. Thank you.